Section 15 of Astounding Stories 12, December 1930, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ape Men of Zlotli, by David R. Sparks. Chapters 1 and 2. Chapter 1. Kirby did not know what mountains they were. He did know that the Manlicker bullets of eleven bad Mexicans were whining over his head and whizzing past the hoofs of his galloping stolen horse. The shots were mingled with yelps which pretty well curdled his spine. In the circumstances the unknown range of snow mountains towering blue and white beyond the arid windy plateau, offering he could not tell what dangers, seemed a paradise. Looking at them Kirby laughed harshly to himself. As he dug the heels of his aviator's boots into the stallion's flanks, the animal galloped even faster than before, and Kirby took hope. Then more bullets and more yelps made him think that his advantage might prove only temporary. Nevertheless, he laughed again, and as he became accustomed to the feel of a stallion under him, he even essayed a few pistol shots back at the pack of frantic, swarthy devils he had fooled. Three hours ago he had been eating a peaceful breakfast with his friend and commandant, Colonel Miguel de Castanar, in the sunlit patio of the Commandant's hacienda. Castanar, chief of the air patrol for the district, had waxed enthusiastic over the suppression of last spring's revolutionists and the cowed state of upcountry bandits. Captain Freddy Kirby, American instructor of flying to Mexican pilots in the making, had agreed with him, and asked for one of the wasps and three days' leave with which to go visiting in Laredo. The simple matter of a broken fuel line, a forced landing two hundred kilometers from nowhere, and the unlucky proximity of the not-so-cowed horsemen were the things which had changed the day from what it had been to what it was. The one piece of good fortune which had befallen him since the bandits had surrounded the wrecked wasp, looted it, and taken its lone pilot prisoner, was the break he was getting now. During the squadron's first halt to feed, he had knocked down his guards and made a bolt for the grazing stallion. So far the attempt was proving worth while. On and on the stallion lunged toward the white mountains. Kirby's eyes became red-rimmed now from fatigue and the glare of the sun and the dust of the pitilessly bare plateau. A negligible scalp wound under his mop of straw-colored hair, slight as it was, did not add to his comfort. But still he would not give up, for the horse, as if it sensed what its rider needed most, was making directly for a narrow ravine which debouched on the plateau from the nearest mountain flank. It was the promise of cover afforded by the jagged rocks and jungle growth of that ravine which kept hope alive in Kirby's throbbing brain. The stallion was blown and staggering. Foam from the heavily bitted mouth flashed back in great yellow flakes against Kirby's dust-caked aviator's tunic. But just the same, the five-mile gallop had carried both horse and rider beyond range of any but the most expert rifle shot, and Kirby knew that if his own splendid mount was almost ready to crash, the horses of his pursuers must be in worse shape still. So for the third time since the fight had begun, he laughed. This time there was no harshness, but only relief in the sound which came from his dry lips. Ten minutes later he flung himself out of his saddle. Like the caress of a vast, soothing hand, the shadowed coolness of the ravine lay upon him. They splashed in the water overflowing from a spring at the base of an immense rock. At once Kirby dropped the reins on the stallion's neck, giving him his freedom, and as the horse lowered his head to drink, Kirby stooped also. There was cover everywhere. Kirby's first move after pulling both himself and the horse away from the spring was to glance up the long, deeply shaded canyon which he had entered. A gash hacked into the breast of the steep mountain as by a titanic axe. Then, reassured as to the possibilities for a defensive retreat, he glanced back toward the dazzling bare plateau. It was what he saw taking place amongst the sombreroed bandits out there which made the grin of satisfaction fade from his broad mouth. His last glance backward before bolting into the canyon mouth had showed him a ragged squadron of men left far behind, yet galloping after him still. But now— Presently a puzzled frown made wrinkles in Freddy Kirby's wide, sunburned forehead. He relaxed his grip upon the heavy luger, which in his big hands looked like a cap pistol, and rubbed his eyes. But he was not mistaken. The horsemen had halted. 
Out there on the glaring alkali-arid plateau they were standing as still as so many statues. Looking toward the canyon mouth which had swallowed their quarry, they certainly were, but they were halted as completely as men struck dead. Huh! Kirby grunted, and scratched behind his ear. The next second he swung around to look at his horse, uncertain what he was going to do next, but aware of the fact that right now, with a lot of unknown country between himself and Castanar's sunlit patio, the stallion was going to be a friend in need. As he turned, however, prepared to take up the loose reins, something else happened. The stallion let out a neigh as shrill as a trumpet blast. As Kirby jumped, grabbed for the bridle, his fingers found empty air. Like a crazy animal, the stallion leaped past him, barely missing him. Out toward the plain the horse jumped, out and away from the shaded canyon mouth, out toward the spot where the other horses waited. And despite the animal's blown condition, the speed he put into his retreat left Kirby dazed. After a helpless, profanity-filled second, Kirby scratched behind his ear again, as certain as the fact that almost his sole hope of getting back to civilization depended upon the stallion was the fact that the brute did not intend to stop running until he dropped. "'Now what in hell ever got into his crazy head?' Kirby muttered grimly. Then he turned around to glance up the shadow-filled slash of a canyon, and sniffed. "'Huh!' Faintly in the air had risen an odor the like of which he had never encountered in his life. A combination, it was, of the unforgettable stench which hangs over a battlefield when the dead are long unburied, and of a fragrance more rare, more heady, more poignantly sweet than any essence ever concocted by Parisian perfumer. With the drifting scent came a sound, faint, carrying from a distance, the rumble which Kirby heard was almost certainly that of a geyser. There was no telling what had brought the troop of horsemen to a halt, but after a time Kirby knew that the cause of his horse's sudden departure must have been a whiff of the strange perfume. For a long time he stood still, watching the crazy stallion dwindle in size, watching the line of unexpectedly timid bandits. Then, when it became apparent that the horsemen were going to stay put either until he came out, or showed that he never was coming out, he shrugged and swung on his heel so that he faced up the canyon. The odor was dying away now, and the geyser rumble was gone. In Kirby's heart came a mingled feeling of tense uneasiness and fascinated curiosity. Momentarily he was almost glad that his horse had bolted, and that his pursuers were blocking any lane of retreat except that offered by the canyon. If things had been different, the queer behavior of the Mexicans, the unaccountable actions of his horse, and the equally strange growth of his own uneasiness might have made him uncertain whether he would go up the canyon or not. Now it was the only thing to do, and Kirby was glad, because fear or no fear, he wanted to go on. "'I wonder,' he said out loud as he started, "'just what the denizens of First Street in Kansas would say to a layout like this.'" Chapter Two. At the end of an hour he was still wondering. At midday the canyon was chill and dank, lit only by a half-light which at times dwindled to a deep dusk as the rock walls beetled together hundreds of feet above his head. Always when he stumbled through one of the darkest passages he heard and half saw immense gray bats flapping above him. In the half-lit reaches he hardly took a step without seeing great rats with gray coats, yellow teeth, and evil pink eyes but rats and bats combined were not as bad as the snakes. They were almost white, and nowhere had he seen rattlers of such size. If his caution relaxed for a second, they struck at him with fangs as long and sharp as needles. The tortured, twisted cedars, the palaverdi, acatilla, chola, opunti, through which he edged his laborious way, all offered an almost animate, armed hostility. Altogether this journey was the least sweet he had taken anywhere, yet he went on. Why had eleven Mexican bandits refused to advance even to within decent rifle range of the canyon's mouth? What was there about the putrid, yet gorgeous perfume that had made the stallion go off his nut, so to speak? After a time Kirby veered away from a fourteen-foot rattler which flashed in a loathsome coil on his left hand. Hungry, weakened by all he had been through since breakfast time, he plodded doggedly on but a moment later he stumbled past a twisted cedar, and then stopped, forgetting even the snakes. At his feet lay the bleached skeleton of a man. 
Beside the right hand, in a position which indicated that only the final relaxation of death had loosened his grip upon a precious object, lay a cylinder carefully carved of rich yellow gold. Of the science of anthropology, Kirby knew enough to make him sure that the dolichocephalic skull and characteristically shaped pelvic and thigh bones of the skeleton had belonged to a white man. As for the cylinder, but he was not so sure what that was. Regardless of the dry swish of a rattler's body on the rocks behind him, he lifted the object from the spot in which it had lain for no man knew how long. Of much the size and shape of an old-time cylindrical wax phonograph record, the softly gleaming thing weighed, he judged, almost two pounds. Two pounds of soft virgin gold of a quality as fine as any he had seen amongst all the treasures brought out of Mexico, Yucatan, and Peru combined. But the gold was not the only thing. If Kirby was human enough to think in terms of treasure, he was also enough of an amateur anthropologist to hold his breath over the carvings on the yellow surface. First he recognized the ancient symbols of sun and moon, and then a representation, semi-realistic, semi-conventionalized, of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, known in all the annals of primitive Mexican religions. Good enough! But the mere symbols by no means told the whole story of the cylinder. The workmanship was archaic, older than any Aztec art Kirby knew, older than Toltec, older far, he ventured to guess, than even the earliest archaic Mayan carvings. God, what a find! For a moment it seemed almost impossible that he, Freddie Kirby, native of Kansas, unromantic aviator, should have been the one to discover this relic of an unknown lost race. Yet the cylinder of gold was there, in his hand. After a long minute Kirby looked around him, then listened. From up the canyon came the provocative rumble of the geyser. It was closer now, and Kirby, glancing at his watch which had been spared to him in the wasp's crash, noted that just forty-four minutes had passed since the last eruption. There was nothing to be done about the bleached skeleton. So tucking the precious cylinder into his tunic, Kirby headed on up the gash of a canyon. Far away indeed seemed the neat, maple-shaded asphalt street, the rows of parked cars and farm wagons, the telephone office and drug store and bank of the Kansas town where he had grown up. Time passed until he again heard the geyser, and again was dizzied by the perfume. As the fragrance, close and powerful now, died away, he flailed with one arm at a two-foot bat which flapped close to his head and then he trudged his dogged way around a deeply shadowed bend, and found the chasm not only almost wholly dark, but narrower than it had been at any previous point. "'Holy mackerel!' Kirby groaned. "'Phew! If this keeps up, I—' He stopped. His jaw dropped. "'Oh, hell!' The beetling walls narrowed in until the gash was scarcely fifteen feet wide. Further progress was barred by a smooth wall which rose sheer in front of him. Kirby did not know how many seconds passed before he made out through the gloom that the wall was man-made and carved with the same symbols of sun, moon, and feathered serpent, which ornamented the cylinder of gold. But when he did realize at last, the shout with which he expressed his feeling was anything but a groan. It simply meant that the skeleton which once had been a man had almost surely found the golden cylinder beyond the wall, and not in the canyon. And if the dead man had passed that smooth, carved barrier, another man could do it. Kirby jumped forward, began to search in the darkness for some hidden entrance. Minute after minute passed. He gave another cry. He saw a long, upright crack in the stone surface, and a quick push of his hands made the stones in front of him give almost an inch. All at once his shoulder was planted, and behind that square shoulder was straining all the muscle of his two-hundred-pound body. The result was all that he desired. When he ceased pushing, a slab of rock gaped wide before him, giving entrance to a pitch-dark tunnel. For a moment he held the portal back, then, releasing his pressure, he stepped into the dark passage. By the time a ponderous grating of rocks assured him that the door had swung shut of its own weight, he had produced matches and struck a light. The puny flame showed him a curving passage hewn smoothly through the heart of bedrock. Before the flare died, he walked twenty feet, and as another match burned to his fingers, he found the right-hand curve of the passage, giving way to a left-hand twist. After that he dared use no more of his precious matches. 
but just when the darkness was beginning to wear badly on his nerves, he uttered a low cry. As he increased his rapid walk to a run, the faint light he had suddenly seen ahead of him grew until it became a circular flare of daylight which marked the tunnel's end. Out of the passage Kirby strode with shoulders square and head up, his cool, level, practical blue eyes wide with wonder. Out of the tunnel he strode into the valley of the perfumed geyser. God above! The words were vibrant with hoarse reverence. He saw the sunlight of a cliff-surrounded diminutive Garden of Eden. He saw a veil of flowering grass, of palms and live oaks, saw patches of lilies so huge as to transcend belief, and dizzying clumps of tree cactus almost as tall as the palms themselves. What was more, he saw in the center of this upland, cliff-guarded valley a gaping black orifice which every faculty of judgment told him was the mouth of the geyser of perfume, and beside it, outstretched on a smooth sheet of rock which glistened as though coated with a layer of clear, sparkling glass, he saw— Kirby blinked his eyes rapidly, hardly believing what he saw. On the glistening rock lay the perfectly preserved figure of a Spanish conquistador, in full armor. Morion and breastplate were in place, and glistened as though they had been burnished this morning. And the Spaniard's dark, handsome, bearded face, Kirby saw instantly that no decay had touched it, that even the hairs of the beard were perfect. The whole armor-clad corpse gleamed softly with a covering of the same glassy substance which covered the rock. Kirby glanced at his watch, saw that twelve minutes must elapse before the geyser spouted again. Then his eyes narrowed. He remained standing where he was, hard by the mouth of the tunnel, knowing that a wise man would conduct cautiously his exploration of this valley of wonders. Arsenic! Silicone! The two words stood out sharply in his thought. In Africa existed plenty of springs, whose waters contained enough arsenic to bring death to those who drank. Might not the Spaniard's presence here be explained, then, by assuming that the geyser water was charged with a strong arsenic content, and, in addition, with some sort of silicon solution which, left to dry in the air, hardened to glass? Lord, what a discovery to take back with him to Kansas! Almost it made the discovery of the golden cylinder pale by comparison. Why, the commercial uses to which this silicone water might be put were almost without limit, and the owner of the concession might confidently expect to make millions. It was while Kirby stood there, breathless and jubilant, waiting for the geyser to spout, that he began to feel that he was being watched. Suddenly, with a start, he shot a sweeping glance over the whole grove. But that did no good. He saw nothing save sunlight and waving green leaves. Eleven days were to pass before he discovered all that was to be involved in that sensation of being gazed at by unseen eyes. End of chapters 1 and 2